Hello. Welcome everyone to our session today, Cultivating Learning, Building Community with Murals. Um, I'm Philippa Rappaport, the lead for education and engagement at the Smithsonian Office of Educational Technology, which is a central education office at the Smithsonian and the office behind the Smithsonian Learning Lab. I'm joined today by Maureen Leary, she is the Youth and Family Programs Manager at the Smithsonian National Postal Museum. Also, Rafael Lopez, an award-winning illustrator, artist, and muralist, whose work you can find at the Smithsonian. Uh, also, Tess Porter is working behind the scenes. She's our user experience strategist at the Smithsonian Office of Educational Technology. And we're joined today by our ASL interpreter, Amanda Grazian, and also uh, Carmen Cromarty will be doing our captioning today. So thank you everyone for joining us and for being here, um, our presenters and, the, and our audience. So uh, murals are one of the oldest visual art forms known to humans, and they've been used to spread social and political messages, reflect cultural identity, and revitalize neighborhoods. In our session today, Maureen and Raphael will explore how educators in all types of learning environments can leverage mural making to encourage self-expression and build community. You leave the session today with resources and strategies to explore murals as an art form and also to initiate your own mural projects with learners of all ages. This is a very special session today. Raphael has created 13 U.S. postal stamps. He's created 57 portraits documenting Latino heritage and culture that are displayed at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Latino. And he's worked extensively with the National Postal Museum as their first guest artist, teaching workshops to children and families in the Washington, D.C. area. Maureen is a treasured educator at the Smithsonian. She's been here about 25 years, started out at the Smithsonian Early Enrichment Center, which is a nationally recognized preschool program, focusing on using museums and community resources to enrich the lives of young children um, and provide a positive foundation for lifelong experiences. From there, she went to the National Postal Museum and she has been one of the key figures across the entire Smithsonian Institution, ensuring that we engage our young audiences thoughtfully and meaningfully. So I'm so pleased you both are able to be here today. We'd love for this session today to be interactive. So please, Feel free to um, share your comments and ideas in the chat. Um, we'll be checking that throughout the presentation today. Make sure you um, mark that it's a comment that goes to everyone so that everyone can see it. Um, and if you have questions at any time, please feel free to put to use the Q&A button and we'll address those either at the time or at the end of our session. I see some of you are already introducing yourselves in the chat. It's really wonderful to see you here. Um, and we'll be we'll be chatting more throughout the event. You probably know, but you've joined us. Uh, this is this is part of our programming to enrich um, the Smithsonian Learning Lab, which is a free online platform where you can discover digital museum resources from across the Smithsonian create interactive learning experiences, and then share your discoveries and creations with others. We will be sharing resources today in the Smithsonian Learning Lab. We've created a special collection just for this session, and you'll be able to find all the resources that we're discussing in that collection. And we'll post that link to the chat. Uh, I want to draw your attention to our educator page on the lab. So if you go to the bottom of any page of the lab and click on Get Started, this is the page you'll see. And we have all kinds of content there to help you uh, use the lab to discover, create, and share. And then if you click at the top there, you see it says Webinars and Events. That will take you to our archived sessions. Okay. Um, 
And you can find a whole range of programming there to help you think about how to use museum digital museum content effectively for learning. Uh, upcoming, we have two really wonderful sessions coming up this spring. At the end of March, the next event in our Cultivating Learning series, we'll be working with Eden Cho, who's from the National Museum of American History, and she'll be talking about civic engagement with young people. That's on March 27th. And then the following month, April 24th, Anne Helmrich will be our guest, and she is the director of the Archives of American Art, and she'll be talking about developing informational literacy. So all of the logistics done, let's dive into our program. A reminder that our session is recorded. That's what allows us to make it into the archived session. And let's start out with a question. The question we want to pose to you all today is, why might you make a mural? And while you're putting your, your thoughts in the chat, I will turn it over to Maureen. All right, um, do we want to move to the next slide with the um, the pictures of the Postal Museum? Am I introducing the Postal Museum now, I think? <laughs> um, so hello, everybody, and thank you, Philippa, for that lovely introduction. Uh, as she, Philippa noted, I am the Youth and Family Programs Manager at the Postal Museum, and I always like to start with just a little bit of background on the Postal Museum because we are one of the smaller units at the Smithsonian, and we are less well known than many of our counterparts. But we actually have the uh, second largest collection at the institution with over 6 million objects. And a big chunk of these objects is, of course, postage stamps. Um, and we love talking about stamps, especially the ones Rafael Lopez designed. Um, but our collection is much broader than that. And we are definitely more than a stamp museum. We are at heart an American history museum. And we offer comprehensive historical content on the postal service in the US, mail and mail delivery, postal transportation and innovations, and all the people, places, and things that have been and continue to be so vital to the operations of the United States Postal Service. Um, so I think, Philippa, should I keep going with my slides, or did you want to go back to the order of the program, or are we talking about anything coming through in the chat? on uh, why why people make murals. I see we have um, certainly some of the things that uh, I would think of um, to culturally pull your community together, uh, encourage my students to, to um, bring together several threads of learning. Um, we have a lot in the chat. I hope, encourage people to read it, connect people with art for sure, um, to recognize community and a moment in time. Um, that's a great one for um, what I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, so we have some some really wonderful answers uh, in the chat, and um, I, as I said, I encourage everybody to to take a moment to go and and take take a read. Uh, okay, and if if I'm Philippa, did you want to go through the order of the program, and then I'll do the um, go and dive into my slides? Sure. Sure. Um, so we've already done our introduction, but. Um, the program for today is that Maureen will give a history of post office murals. We will do a close looking activity. And then Raphael will talk about why make a mural. So we're, we'll return back to that question and he'll really go through sort of the nuts and bolts of, of his work um, with various communities making murals. And then at the end, we'll have time for Q&A. So I'll follow your lead, Maureen. For okay, beautiful. Sorry, <laughs> I think uh, I got things a little bit out of order. Apologies for that. Um, but yeah, I do. I again, I'm seeing some really uh, wonderful answers in the chat. Um, in, uh, increased visual representation, celebrating diversity, um, bringing beauty to an environment. All of these things, I think, are um, things we're going to uh, touch on at least somewhat today. And I appreciate everyone who has contributed to that conversation. Uh, so um, to jump into um, one of my favorite topics related to postal history, if we can move to the next slide. Um, so um, I want to talk today about the New Deal era post office murals 
And these are just, I find them to be a really fascinating topic. Um, these murals are spread throughout the country. And I would bet most of our viewers here today could find one in a post office not too far from where they live. Uh, if any of you have one near you, please put that in the chat. I would, I would love to hear about it. Uh, the history of these post office murals starts with Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was president from 1933 to 1945. This was, of course, a very tumultuous time in U.S. history. The Great Depression that began in 1929 meant that millions of Americans were unemployed or underemployed when FDR's first term started. Uh, next slide. So after taking office, Roosevelt quickly announced the New Deal, which featured numerous social programs designed to both put people to work and improve their lives. And artists were included in the jobs initiatives and a massive volume of public art was created as a result. So these programs fell under the Works Progress Administration, which was commonly known as the WPA, which was a government agency that ran from 1935 to 1943, with the goal of providing jobs to the unemployed while also building up public infrastructure. The post office murals fall under the general New Deal art umbrella. However, they were born out of a much smaller, more specific initiative that was designed to bring art to people all over the country. In 1934, the Treasury Department's section of painting and sculpture was officially established, later renamed the section of fine arts and generally referred to simply as the section, which is what you'll hear me do today. Uh, its mission was to transform federal buildings, mostly post offices, into democratic art galleries. So I wanted to make sure to point out this distinction because the murals commissioned by the section under the Treasury Department are commonly mistaken for WPA work. So even if you hear them referred to that way, if it's a historic post office mural, it's almost certainly a product of the Treasury Department, not the WPA, and its purpose was very different. These murals were intended to uplift and unify communities during a difficult time, uh, and they do that in much the same way that modern murals aim to do. So this program was, was very successful in its output. It spanned nine years, employed 850 artists and produced 1,371 murals. Post offices were selected for this program because in an era before email and cell phones, almost everyone regularly visited the post office to keep in touch with the outside world. And so post offices were really the perfect place to expose average citizens to art. The painted murals typically measured 10 or 12 feet in length and five feet in height. And while the finished murals are of course mostly still on the walls in their original locations, the Smithsonian is fortunate to have many of the mural studies or drafts in its collection. And that is what we'll be looking at today. So these drafts were um, generally made at a scale of one or two inches to one foot. So the mural studies are actually quite small um, and which you can't really tell when you're looking at them on a screen, on a PowerPoint. Um, and that was actually a surprise to me when I first saw them in person at the American Art Museum. Next slide. So um, the American Art Museum at the Smithsonian has about 200 of these mural studies in their collection. And it was extremely hard to choose which ones to share today. But I uh, really was trying to uh, select ones that would give an overview of the types of themes that dominated this body of work. So here we see uh, a study for a post office mural in Freeland, Pennsylvania, which is a good example of a pleasant bucolic scene that many of the murals depicted. Mural artists um, <clears throat> Uh, were also encouraged to pursue themes that were optimistic or historic and to avoid conflicts of race or gender or class. Um, the section wanted artwork that would be accessible and relatable for, um, for local residents. And um, I just want to call out something I see in the chat. We have um, Salina Arts and Humanities Foundation says, I work in an old post office building in Salina, I think I was pronounced Salina, Kansas that has New Deal statues on the front. Yeah, communication and land installed by Carl C. Mose in 1940. Yeah, that's actually such an interesting point because 
some of the artwork commissioned under um, the section was were actually sculptures. I didn't really mention that at all in my presentation, but you are right. Um, there were about 1,600 works of art in total, and almost 1,400 of those were murals. And, um, and then there were sculptures as well. So that's cool. You've got an example of that in your community. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So uh, here is another example of a landscape scene for a post office in Cornelia, Georgia. Artists were encouraged to collaborate with the local community whenever um, when they were choosing their subjects. Although in practice, many of the artists never even visited the location where their murals eventually hung. They often uh, did at least correspond with the postmaster when selecting topics. And um, there was a design approval process that was tightly controlled by the section. You know, it can actually be fascinating to compare the mural studies with the finished product to see where they decided the changes needed to be made. Next slide. So uh, as I mentioned, there were of course many different kinds of things depicted on these murals. There are a large number of them showing everyday scenes of leisure and community. This one uh, shows us a town festival in Iowa where we see a marching band and people dancing. And if we were to zoom in to those uh, signs on the light post, we would see they say, welcome to Hamburg. And there's an interesting footnote for this particular mural. The original mural was destroyed during post office renovations in the 1970s. But in 1999, an art class at the University of Wisconsin painted a replica for the new post office. And this mural is the, uh, done by the students is on view now in the lobby. Unfortunately, hundreds of post office murals have been destroyed or taken down due to varied circumstances, but there are still about 900 on view in the US. Next slide. So here's another example of a mural depicting leisure activities by Jenny Megafun. This one has an interesting anecdote to it as well. The scene is set in Anson, Texas, but the artist primarily lived in Colorado, New York, and California. During her research on appropriate subject matter for the Anson murals, she learned about the town's annual square dance called the Texas Cowboys Christmas Ball, a three-night event which began in 1885 and continues today. Uh, the artist's research was Evidently not exhaustive though, as she added a detail to the final painting that we don't see in this study here, a small liquor jug um, can be seen in the actual mural at the foot of the musician who is seated in the lower right corner. Uh, this ended up creating great concern among some town residents as Anson was and still is a dry town. Um, many locals were offended by what they took to be a subtle jab at the community's upright moral character. Uh, next slide. So moving on to another common mural theme, industry was frequently highlighted in these artworks. During a time of great hardship for many, murals depicting industry were intended to emphasize the abilities of communities to work hard, come together, in pursuit of a common goal. Uh, this artist, Natalie Henry, took very seriously the charge to reflect the local community of Springdale, Arkansas. While planning the mural, she interviewed Springdale residents and structured her design to include all the local crops and livestock that had brought prosperity to the settlement. And um, a close look at those details reveal a strawberry patch and a poultry yard in the foreground with a vineyard and an orchard behind them. And then you can see wheat fields and meadows at the back of the painting with the um, view of the Ozark Mountains in the distance. So this wouldn't be a, a scene you would probably see in reality, but she worked very hard to try to fit all of those important elements into this one image. Um, and although Henry was living in Chicago at the time, she showed her personal connection to Arkansas by including several portraits of family members who lived there in the image. Next slide. So this mural from Buchanan, Michigan, depicts another um, aspect of local industry that was popular in these murals, and that is factory production, especially types that required skilled workers. Um, and this one is notable because it includes both workers who are clearly busy at their tasks, uh, as well as men who appear to be taking a companionable lunch break. 
Um, the artist for this mural, Gertrude Goodrich, lived in New York and sometime before her death in 2017, she went back to Michigan to see the mural and uh, she discovered that it had been painted over. <laughs> and so she requested that it be restored. She um, provided a large black and white print of an early mural study to hang in place of the mural while funds were sought to uncover it from four layers of paint. Um, that process is still ongoing. So the fate of this mural is a bit uncertain. Uh, we certainly hope it gets uncovered. Um, it should be safe, meanwhile, under all that paint. And there is still hanging there the black and white image of it if uh, if you're in that area and, and want to take a, take a look at it. Um, next slide. So local history um, is another important topic covered in many of these murals. Here is um, a description of this mural from the Smithsonian Collection Record. On receiving a commission for the Dolgoville, New York, post office mural, James Michael Newell read extensively on the history of the Mohawk Valley and found, he wrote, some of the most interesting and exciting American material I have ever looked into. In Underground Railroad, Newell captures a moment of democratic idealism important in Dogelville history. His painting depicts an abolitionist farmer hurrying escaped slaves out of sight as dawn breaks at the Brockett Farm, one of two underground railroad stations near the Dogelville village limits. Newell highlighted the heroism of those who were enslaved and the people who helped them uh, by showing a man leaning into lantern light to read a flyer offering a reward for his capture. Next slide. So this mural entitled The Fur Traders is representative of Idaho's first permanent American fur trading post, Fort Henry, which was established in 1810 on the Snake River near St. Anthony's, which was also the site of the first annual rendezvous between traders and American Indians in that region. So this um, painting reflects one of the most important and early scenes defining the, that relationship between native people and those from European cultures, which was the trade and the, the mixture of um, cultures together. And, um, and it's showing the trade from the Native American tribes in that area, which were mostly the Shoshone and the, those um, settlers who came in who were mountain men or trappers. And Native Americans feature in about 400 of the total um, collection of post office murals although only 24 of the 850 muralists were Native American. Next slide. In 2019, the US Postal Service paid homage to these murals by issuing a set of five stamps with murals on them. And here you can see a couple of the main themes I've just highlighted, um, including the Native Americans and uh, landscapes and the Stamp in the top center shows mail carriers readying for an airmail flight. Post offices, postal workers, and mail delivery were also very common themes found in these murals, which of course is very fitting since they were all going up in post offices. So 30 million sets of, um, of these stamps were printed at the time of issue. And while these stamps are no longer sold by the Postal Service, they are very easy to find on secondary market sites such as Amazon and Hipstamp um, if you'd like to own your own tiny version of a post office mural. Um, okay, next slide, please. Um, and before I get to this one, I'm just taking a peek at the chat and um, I see a question about, I'm curious as to what percentage of the art was created by women and I am gonna get to that, do not worry. Um, so, uh, but now I'd like to spend a few minutes taking a closer look at one mural. Um, this here is the mural study for band, <laughs> excuse me, band concert by Marion Gilmore. And the finished mural hangs in a post office in Corning, Iowa. And we will do our close looking with that image, but I want to point out here one interesting tidbit. So if you look to the Because once it debuted, it 
be very. Um, one final detail I'd like you to notice on this uh, image is the gray rectangle at the bottom center. Though um, this happens to be the only study we've looked at today that actually has that rectangle there, it is actually common to see that on these mural drafts. And in the next slide, um, I'm going to go ahead and advance. So you can see the reason for that. Um, so the reason that gray rectangle is on many of these mural studies is that the murals were typically placed above the door to the postmaster's office, because that was a very central area where everybody coming in and out of the post office could see the artwork. Uh, and so the artists wanted to account for that space that was going to be taken up by the top of the door when they were creating their, their drafts. Um, Um, I think Maureen might be freezing. Is it? The details of these, excuse me? Maureen, Alipa, did you need me to? Oh, you're no. Just a little bit. I'm so sorry. Just could just go back a minute or two. So I think people got that the gray, you know, the, you talked about how that was, mm -hmm. uh, they planned okay. for that. Um, but if you want you me to start from the top of the slide here? Activity, yeah. Okay. Thank okay. You. Sorry about that. This internet is, you know, never perfect. But thank you for letting me know, Philippa. I definitely want to make sure everybody hears. Here's what I'm saying. Okay. So um, that rectangle that we talked about at the end of the last slide was um, on a lot of these mural studies because these murals were typically placed above the door to the postmaster's office, and. Um, that was a space where um, a lot of people could see the artwork. There was, uh, you know, a very open area, common area where people were, could go in and out and and see the art. So uh, that was a great place to put the murals and the artists wanted to account for that space when they were making their drafts. So um, I wanted to use this image for our um, close looking because the details of these artworks were really scrutinized by the section. And they often required changes to align them more closely with the ethos of the community. So I'd like you to um, please just take a little bit of time to, to, to really look at this painting. And then um, I'm gonna ask you to note in the chat any details that jump out at you. Um, and so for this right now, we're just really just making observations about what you see and not you know interpreting it or putting any meaning on it, but just, just noting in the chat any whatever details uh, jump out at you, like I said. So we'll take a minute to do that, take a look and put some things in the chat. Lots of movement and color, strange angle in the forefront, uh, the glow of lights from the bandstand, we see the moon. Uh, yeah, one of the things I noticed, the difference between this one and the draft is this one to me seemed brighter, a bit brighter. Um, mixture of genders, ages, races, pets allowed at the band concert, <laughs> um, families, community members. The light is different from different points of view. Fun expressions, lots of conversation. A lot of children, um, even though it appears to be late in <laughs> late in the evening. Uh, it seems welcoming, illuminating light. Those are great, great comments. Um, okay. So I, it seems there's a bit of a theme there in what you notice. You see uh, certainly that aspect of community, different types of people, um, and just kind of the general sort of festive fun feeling about this, um, this event. Um, so now we're gonna take, do another, uh, take another step with this. And I want you to look at this artwork and think about it through a particular lens that is related to your identity. So these could be things like uh, gender, race, age, sexual orientation, culture, religion, family role, occupation, I mean, the list can go on. Um, so whatever, whatever lens you choose. Um, so when you're looking through the painting at the painting through that lens, are there different details that seem particularly noteworthy to you? Um, does it make you feel more connected to the image, less connected to the image? Does it create questions for you about what's going on in the picture, what the history of the community is? Um, so I invite you to share any reactions you have um, to that image when considering it through your own personal identity lens. Um, or you could 
Try a lens that's not one of your own um, and think about how your reaction to this painting might differ if you try to step outside your own perspective. So um, so just kind of to give it um, more, going beyond surface level there and giving it a little bit more meaning. So I do see some things in the chats and I see um, uh, diverse. And then uh, the next comment is I don't see any Asian Americans. Um, uplifting spirit of the community time ago. Yes, these were all um, dec made decades ago. So multi-racial family or community. No woman in sneakers. <laughs> Certainly different than modern times. Um, so uh, women in women in the orchestra um, and a uh, family uh, an environment that is friendly for animals. All the women are wearing dresses. Not many African Americans. Um, I have a comment. It reminds me of a small town in Venezuela. It tells you a story of a celebration, maybe a Sunday evening. People dressed in different attire for different occupations. Yeah, I said that was a detail I noticed too. Uh, the baby in the orchestra. <laughs> I don't think I saw that. <laughs> I'll look for that. Um, it is, you know, it is, there's a lot going on in this picture and some of it may be hard to see. I, I do, if you're interested in it, I do recommend going online and zooming in. Uh, a walkable space, no cars or types of transportation. That's an interesting one. Not, not a picnic setting. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Um, no indigenous folks. Everyone seems able-bodied. Yep. Yeah. You all are definitely picking up on some of these, um, some of these themes. The, the reason why I chose this particular, uh, exercise and, um, I wanted to wrap up with this. This, this activity is called lenses. Uh, obviously I made reference to lenses. Um, and I, I think it raises an important point that I, I didn't really touch on in the rest of this conversation. Uh, these murals are an impressive body of work and they give us a unique snapshot into the lifestyles and values from people across the country during a very specific time. But the lenses through which this group of artists looked were not actually very diverse. Of the 850 artists who did this work, there were 162 women, 24 American Indians, and a few others uh, from minority groups. So there were specifically there were three Black artists, and at least a, a few Latino and Asian. Though it's actually difficult to track down exact numbers because of the frequent conflation with the WPA artwork. Um, so women and minorities had some representation in the artists who created this large body of work. Um, but still, with, you know, not surprisingly for the 1930s and 40s, the artists were overwhelmingly white men. Uh, and I could do an entire presentation on the controversies some of these murals have engendered, um, especially when looking at them through a modern lens. Um, but, um, but today we were focusing on the positive aspect of how murals can build community. So I didn't want to uh, dive into all of that. Um, but I did want to make sure to mention it because if you are interested in exploring these murals in your learning environment, it will be very important to do some background research and really consider the lens through which the story is being told, both in terms of the times and also the personal identity of the artist. So um, these murals do offer us a fascinating glimpse into local history and culture from places across the country. They are certainly a valuable teaching tool, and I think they are worth cherishing but it is important to look at them with a critical eye also. Uh, okay, so I have just one final image on the next slide to share with you um, as I prepare to hand the program over to Rafael Lopez. Uh, I thought this one was apt as it depicts a 70 foot tall mural that is located in Washington, DC, fairly close to the Postal Museum. And it's a mail carrier. The man in the mural is Buck Hill. Uh, he's a lifelong Washingtonian who died in 2017 at the age of 90. He began performing in jazz clubs along the U Street Corridor in the 1940s when the area was known as Black Broadway, and he played with jazz greats like Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis, but he he chose not to take a show on the road, even though he could have, uh, and he wanted to, to stay in D.C., uh, and he spent more than 40 years as a mail carrier, and uh, his dedication to both of his careers earned him the nickname, the Whalen Mailman. Um, and so the before and after photos here demonstrate the power of murals to transform and beautify public spaces, as well as commemorate important people and events. 
And uh, here to talk to you a lot more about that is my good friend, Rafael Lopez. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Maureen. That was really interesting. It was fascinating to hear all about this. And I have a lot of questions because many of the things that I saw were painted on canvas. And I wonder if those were finished pieces or they were eventually put on the wall. So today I was invited, hey, as a Latino muralist. So here we have a minority and the murals that I have created uh, in the past uh, 18 years. So thank you again for uh, giving me some time this afternoon to tell you a little bit more about myself. And I'll give you the step-by-step -step things of how do you create a mural? Because it's easy to just say, let's do a mural, but how did you get started? So uh, first of all, uh, I'm gonna thank Philippa for helping me with the, 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 the sliding uh, trans transitions. And I'll tell a little bit about my background first. My name is Rafael Lopez. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. I'm known also as a children's book illustrator. I've been doing this for almost 20 years and I truly enjoy because I like to put diverse characters on my books. And I especially like to um, talk about uh, people that are overcoming obstacles in my stories. I like to actually work with people that write positive stories about people that overcome these huge obstacles. So um, um, it's it's very uh, um, rewarding to do that. Next slide. So today it's about maybe doing something beautiful, which was also um, part of the inspiration of creating this book, the work that we have done in my community in San Diego. Uh, let's move up to the next one. I was born in Mexico City. This is me um, pretending to be a baby Diego Rivera, I guess. I don't know. And uh, I come from a, a, a country and a culture of uh, muralism. And the muralism in Mexico reflected more the social injustices that were happening in Mexico. There, were, there was no middle class. There was either rich people or poor people. So people like uh, great uh, artists like Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente Orozco, or Cicados were the big representatives of the muralism of the time. Next picture. And I'm also surrounded by color, lots of color. This is the colors of Mexico that you see every day. So if you have chromophobia, you're in a lot of trouble if you go to Mexico. Uh, next next slide. Thank you, Philippa. Uh, I'm the son of two architects. They met in the 1950s at the UNAM, the big university in central Mexico. And I, I wanted to become an architect myself, but I was terrible with numbers and math and I never really got along. So the closest thing and my parents, thank you to my parents' encouragement, I became an artist. And it took a little while to establish myself, but I'm glad that uh, they believed in me. Next page or slide. So currently, I live in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico, part of the time, but I also live in San Diego, California. But this is not the San Diego that I live in. This is the San Diego that you get to see when you come and visit it for the first time. I bought an old warehouse in old uh, downtown San Diego in the warehouse district, which is the next slide here. This is what uh, my neighbor looks like in my imagination. Everything was pretty much gray and there was lack of uh, uh, a human participation, of neighborly participation. I'll show you some photos of the things that you can actually find every day. Next picture. I was surrounded by this and it was amazing how we created a beautiful environment inside our warehouse. Uh, but uh, sadly, when we walked outside, this is what we saw every day. Uh, you know, windows were shot. People weren't talking to each other. People were afraid to walk outside to, you know, because they didn't want to find, find themselves in situations where they could be in danger. So we talked to the neighbors and we said, how could we allow this? You know, we are a neighborhood. We have to do something about it. I started walking around next page or photo. And I noticed that there was a lot of walls, empty walls full of graffiti and depilated and peeling paint. And I thought we, why don't I just go and talk to the, the owners of these uh, um, warehouses and ask them if they would like us to create some, some murals in them and, and really just beautify our neighborhood. And the answer was an immediate yes for most everyone. They were just desperate to have someone that would do this for them. Next slide. Let's move to the next slide if we can, Philippa. So... My, the difference, what I wanted to do is I wanted to engage the community in creating their own murals where I could design something that would be very simple. And then uh, the tradition of creating a mural is mostly that uh, you have the artists, you hire the artists because you like their styles. You know, they're going to take three to four months to a year to create the mural. They're going to have three to five assistants helping them out. 
And my idea was that we had a limited time and we needed to engage as many people from the community as possible. So the whole idea of the community uh, um, murals began back in San Diego, back in the late 80s or early 90s. Next slide. So I'm going to tell you a little bit exactly what Maureen was talking about, like the door for the postmaster. You need to find the wall, the permission from someone. You know that this is a very critical area. And it can be anywhere. It could be even at a school. Maybe it's a, an, an abandoned area from the school when no one likes to hang out. Or it could be a critical area in your neighborhood. I, I ask for the permission. I take photos and measurements of the whole wall where I'm going to have some obstacles. What is the distance? If there's any windows, if there's any doors or there's any pipes. So these are my first notes that I do. And I take them all back to the studio. Next slide. And then I start sketching things. Now, I want you to notice that my, my, um, my designs are very graphic, very simple, not controversial. I don't want it to be political. I want to avoid conflict. I want my murals to be a moment for you in your busy life to just take a break, an eye break, and just sit there and reflect and pick on any symbol that you see in it and make a meaning out of it, whether it reflects freedom of happiness or quietness or euphoria, whatever it is. So I designed, I decided to design something that was very graphic and very simple and very flat so that people would not be, the people that would be participating in the creative the creation of the mural wouldn't be intimidated if they had never held a brush in their lives before. Uh, so this is the uh, developed style that I created for a while. Um, next, uh, next slide. And this is what I do. I actually, once I have a, an approved project and I know exactly the, the proportions of the wall, I put them into my computer and I do everything now on the computer on a program called Photoshop because then I can pick up colors and try them in different uh, areas. Th th this creates things to go faster that if I do it by hand, you can easily do it by hand. You can do it with watercolor and do different color studies. But doing it on the computer allows me to have five or six different versions of the same mural and change the quickly and go from cool to warm and change the, you know, the whole thing around in a matter of just minutes though. Next slide. So here we are. I have selected some of the colors that I have done. And then I'll talk about this grid that you see there later on though. So this is what I do. I print this out and I actually number those lines and I'll explain to you that later. But these are the colors. Now I need to go and find that color for real because this is only uh, digitally, right? So next slide. I have gone to my paint store. My my, my closest one is the Sherwin-Williams just down the street. Uh, I asked for a color uh, book. They gave me the color book. And what I do is I compare the colors that I have on my screen with the colors that are the most similar that Sherwin-Williams or any paint that you have there are available. And of course, you're gonna need several gallons of all these colors, right? Some of them, you may require three gallons. Some of them is gonna be just a half a gallon, depending on your design. The one thing that I like to do right away is to um, invite them to be sponsors of the program, that we're gonna have this mural painting day with all the, 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 the kids and the, and the community. And many times uh, the people that are helping us uh, raise the money or helping us with paint uh, like to be sponsors. So they give us great deals. So don't forget that. Let them know if they are interested in being sponsors of the program and the, and the big day of painting. Next slide. So here you see me, I'm taking notes and putting the numbers. You see the SW there, that means sharing Williams. Uh, and then what I try to do is I can, you can see how I put the book right next to the screen. I try to match the color as close as possible. So I know that now I'm gonna have all the colors that, that the paint store have, and I'll be able to order them. And they're gonna be as close as possible to what I have on my screen on my computer. Next slide. Here you see when I do, this is the finished product where I print several of this and you can see just how many colors are involved here. I think there's about 20 colors. Try to design your, your murals to have the, the least color possible. The more colors you have, the more money we'll have to spend, of course, the more money you have to raise. But uh, this is where you see, and I print this and I, I actually paste this on the wall where we're gonna paint the mural. So people have a guide and they know exactly what color goes where, and there's no confusion where this pink goes or where this purple goes or this blue goes. Everything is very, very clearly detailed on the wall. Next slide. And everybody thinks, so how do you do it? How do you make those murals? How do you transfer that little tiny sketch into the big wall? These are my high tech <laughs> equipment I use. That blue core that you see down at the bottom, uh, that's what I use to hold it from one end. And on the other end, I just uh, wrapped around a pencil and I create these perfect curves or perfect circles. I also use this snap line where with I, I with the assistance of two other people. 
And I use this snap line to do the gridding. This is the gridding that you'll see in the next image. And this is where you create all the little squares where you're gonna transfer every little square of your drawing and blow it up into the wall. I use a little level to make sure because sometimes uh, some, some, some streets or street, yeah, they go downhill or uphill. So I use a little lever just to make sure that my lines are straight. And what I'm holding on my hand is just a chopstick. And that's how I'm gonna just transfer the drawing. Next slide. Here you see finally the grid. And as you can see, it's numbered from an one to 29 because that means all the feet. This is a very large mural and, and, and also one to nine. So every square that you see there converts into the real wall into two feet by two feet. So every square that you see there, I use a, um, uh, a, a, a giant, uh, a wooden ruler to mark the lines. And those, those black lines that you see across, those are the ones that I snap with that, that snapping light that you saw in the previous image. So you need to have two people to hold both ends very, very tight. And then you, you need someone in the middle to pull it out and then let it go. And then when it snaps, it leaves that chalk mark into the wall. And that's what's gonna you see, you're gonna see here in the following uh, picture, next. Here you see, you can see, barely see those uh, vertical lines and horizontal lines, those are the snap lines. And you can see me using that core where I'm actually creating the, my, the curves that I'm using. Now, this is the probably the most meticulous part where an artist that have a little experience should do. But then I realized that this was a great moment also to teach the kids how to do it and the students how to do it. So, and then on the next line, you see me doing holding. Let's let's look at the next one. I'm holding the, the drawing next to me so I can go square by square. I actually put pieces of tape where I say, this is number one, this is number two, this is number three. So I know exactly in what square I'm standing in front of. And then I look at my drawing and I know exactly what to, what to draw in that particular square. So gridding something up to the, the big size, is just a little time consuming, but it won't take more than a day to actually transfer the, the drawing into it. But the fun part is to actually see the kids doing it. So next one here. And the next line, you see that I invited him to actually learn how to do it. So many volunteers came that first day and I just sat back and I enjoyed myself. And then I just, I came back and I did a few corrections, but we were able to transfer the whole thing in about four hours with when you have several uh, able hands. Next slide. And then what we do once everything is transferred is I start working with only doing the edges of the, the, the figures or the shapes because this is gonna be the more the most meticulous work. So this is where I invite people to that are either um, young artists or, or, or some professional artists or some people that have a little more control. And I ask him and I teach him how to do it. And then they learn very quickly. And I said, I want you just to keep the lines very, very close together, you know, try not to go over the line. And of course, because we're using a specific paint, and I'll tell you more about this paint later. Uh, if there's mistakes, you don't have to panic. You just let it dry in about 10 minutes or five minutes. You can go back and paint over it. And it's like it, ne it never, the, the mistake never happened again. Next slide. So here we are. We actually did the actual line drawing. And as you can see, these are high school kids. And what I like to do, because some of these murals are very tall, I like to invite the taller, the younger kids or the older kids, I'm sorry, to do the upper part. They're, they have a little more consciousness of the, the height. They don't have to be uh, taken care of. So we have the volunteers, mostly adults and some high school kids to actually paint the top part of the mural. And I like to have that finish before we do the bottom part. Let's take a look at the next slide. And here now you can see the younger kids. Usually I like to have some adults also um, Keeping an eye on them, I don't, I don't like him to go over two steps, as you can see. Um, and if they're very young, we like to hold them back. So they are actually now filling in the spaces. Next, next uh, slide. I'm going to show you the progression of how this goes. This is about the first day with all the drawing already transferred. You can see in some of the lines that have been overcorrected, and that's totally fine. And you can see how we started doing only the edges of all the areas. Now, notice all the little dots that I put in there. Those dots are to indicate to the kids later on or to the students or the, the community in, in general what color that will be. So there's no uh, confusion. I mean, you can see clearly where the brown is, where the white will go, where the uh, yellow will go by putting and indicating those little dotted lines. So this is the first day. Next uh, slide. This is about the, the half of the second day. And you can see how strange this looks. It looks really weird, right? But you can see how you are gonna be indicating everything for the uh, the community and the big painting thing to fill in. So I like to keep it this way. People look at it and they go, hmm, that's a very strange mural you created. I go, yeah, it's gonna look very different, believe me. 
So let's take a look at the last slide of the same uh, mural. This is what it looks like at the end. And what's great is to see the kids and uh, they're, they're awed in their eyes when they see the, fun, the, the final product come together though. Okay, next slide. So it usually takes us about a week to do everything. We start on a Monday and then by Friday we are done. And then we like to have the Saturday, the weekend or the Sunday to be the big day. So this strategy here is to invite as many people as possible. I like to invite the media. I like to invite the newspapers or any kind of a local channel because we're tired of uh, negative stories. <laughs> we would like to hear a, a, a lovely, positive local story of what's going on in our community. Uh, we invite people to actually donate or uh, be sponsors for uh, lunches, uh, drinks, and uh, musicians or, or the community by itself. If the community wants to bring us whatever they want to bring and, and present to the rest of the community, uh, we, they, everybody's welcome. So this is the big day when we are going to finish the mural. The mural by this time is about 75% done. And we only have basically the bottom part where the little kids are gonna come. So next picture. These are the basic things that you need for that big day. And I welcome you to take a screenshot of this. You can see the chalk sticks that you're gonna be using to do the transfer. The tarp is very essential because kids could be very messy. Everyone could be messy. I get really messy. So we want to keep it as clean as possible. This is what you're going to put at the very bottom before you start painting. The buckets are for carrying water. I like to always have a source of water very close. Rags because it gets a little messy. Uh, foam picnic bowls are going to be used to uh, pour the color for the kiddos. Uh, the snap line in the core, this is free views with a wooden yardstick. This is what you did when you transfer the drawing. That blue painter tape is what I use when I do straight lines. Most people tell me, how do you achieve those perfect lines? And I go, hey, it's practice. And it's not, of course it's not. It's blue painter's tape. I use the, the painter's tape to actually tape something and I just paint something and I peel it off and you got this perfect, perfect straight lines. The most important things, I like to go to um, Office Depot. Most of these things are bought at either Office Depot or any one of those, um, oh, not Office Depot, I'm sorry, um, uh, Home Depot. Home Depot, or I go to the um, um, the dollar stores. Most of the things that you see here are bought at the dollar store. I spend 40 to $120 max. And then the wooden brushes that you see there, I go to uh, Home Depot and I get a big bag of them. I, if, if you can get 120 of them, they have them in bags like that. And I recommend doing that because those things go to, um, they go fast. Paper towels and, of course, large trash bags. So take a screenshot of this. This is basically all you need to paint a mural. And, of course, paint. So let's move to the next one. So the paint that I use here is exterior um, flat paint. So remember that uh, you need to buy flat paint. If you buy anything like eggshell or anything that is just shiny, it's going to be a disaster because someone can give it two coats and then someone else is going to give it 14 coats and the two coats and the 14 coats is going to look very, very different at the end. But if you use flat exterior flat paint, it's so forgiving that you can have two layers or 14 layers and it's going to look exactly the same. By the time it dries, it's going to just look so evenly the whole thing. You won't see any, any of this little overworked areas though. So this is what I call the color bar. We actually extend some tables and we set up all the colors. And you can see how we already have some of those ladles and ready. And we have the little uh, uh, plastic jars ready to go. And uh, I, what I like to do here is I like to invite the high school kids or some of the adults older. Let, let's look at the next picture. And they're going to be the ones in charge of giving the younger kids the paint. Uh, I'm going to have uh, the colors taped all over the mural where the kids can exactly know where to go and then just say, what, what is your favorite color? It's purple. Okay, there's here's some purple. Go to that area where the purple is. You like pink? Go here. This is, is black your favorite color? Go for it. So this, this is the group that is going to be controlling the colors. So the little kids are not going to be mixing all the other colors as well. They'll be, they're, they'll be in charge. So. Next slide. And then what I do, of course, you have a ton of kids that are going to show up, right? Hopefully you, you expect more than 150. But what do you do when you have 120 kids? You can't have them all painting at the same time. So what we do a week before the mural, we create a calendar where people write their name down. And we have slated times from like 8 o'clock to 8.15, 8.15 to 8.30, 8.30 to 8.45, 8.45 to 9, and so on until 3 o'clock in the afternoon when we start cleaning up. So people put their name down and we have a limit of about 15 kids. And because of their age and their attention span, 
they're only going to be having a, a great time for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes at the most. And then we say time's up and they're super happy. And then the next group moves in and they keep painting. So this is what I'm doing right now. This is the team that came in at the early part of the morning. I have about 15 kids and I teach them a little bit what they have to do, how to follow each the indication of every color. And then they just start filling it in. I tell them not to worry if they go over the line because this is flat paint that is very forgiving. And we're going to come back five minutes later and just correct it. So I just want them to have a great time. Next slide. Here I tell them basically very quickly how to hold the brush when they need to get really close to the edges. And then I just let them go for it. Next one. So here they go. I'll just share some of the photos of everybody painting. Notice too, uh, sometimes what we do, we, we like to also separate the teams into groups like uh, the diamond group. And now let's bring the circle group. And now let's bring the uh, rectangle group or the green group or the orange group. So it's a good idea to also have maybe t-shirts uh, for the event or just different color uh, t-shirts for the people so th we can organize them better because at some point this could get a little chaotic. Uh, usually I like to have a group of about 10 to 15 volunteers with me. Some of them are going to be taking care of the kids. Some are going to be keeping an eye on their safety. Some of them are going to be keeping an eye that the color is not mixed up. Some of them are going to be delivering like the food and the drinks. So it's always great to have a group of 15 to 20 volunteers helping you out that day. Um, another picture. Here you go. Um, we see some of the kids uh, being also just, you know, being oversight by some of the adults and they're just having a great time. Another one. And like I said, this is a community mural. Everybody is welcome, not just kids. Uh, we have um, senior citizens coming in, participating, people that just show up or they are curious to see what's going on, what are we doing? And then we say, you want to paint? And they say, I've never painted before. And they said, oh, well, no, neither half of the people that are here. So please go ahead, grab yourself your favorite color and sit and have a great time for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, next slide. And I mean everybody, including uh, we invite the police uh, uh, people in the place. And I think this is a great opportunity for many of the areas that have been neglected or they have a negative uh, um, perception of the police officers. That, that it's, this is a great opportunity to tell them that we they are part of the community, too, and that we are working all together doing the same thing and, and to, to beautify our neighborhood. Next slide. So what do you do with the other kids while they're waiting, right? Because they show up early and they're gonna have to, they're not gonna paint for another hour, hour and a half. So we create additional activities on the side. One thing to do is to create additional, um, um, just put some uh, fabric out, and they can create their own murals while they wait to paint on the big mural. This is just one example that turned out to be actually pretty amazing. I wish they could put it in the Smithsonian one day because it turned out really well. Here's another one. Let's see what else we do. Another picture. We also have storytelling. I mean, you can select a book and that would be the theme of the book. You can do some paperwork. You can do some origami. You can do different things and have the people sitting in different areas while they wait they, their turn. So you don't have them just sitting around. So you create as many activities as possible. We, we, we've done some yard bombing where you, we can just wrap it around some leaves and then some branches. Next uh, picture. And, you know, one day we selected one of my books that is called... Uh, uh, um, Book Fiesta, and based on one of the illustrations about Book Fiesta, let's take a look at the next uh, slide. We brought some boxes and we let the kids decorate them and create their own imaginary dragons. So as you can see behind it, there's a lot of things going on with all the kids waiting for their turn to do. So you can find so many things to do. You just bring card boxes. They bring, they make their own castles and they paint and they do whatever they have to do or they, they're listening to a story or they're following some kind of a trail to find some treasure stuff. So. Next uh, picture. And of course, it's a perfect excuse to really get to know the community more. So we, well, we take breaks. This case, this was a very Latino community. We invited some of the local dancers and they entertained us for a while. Next one. Um, they, they sang as we continue to paint on. So you, you keep the, the, the whole crowd entertained. Next picture. And this is where the magic really begins. Um, these two girls went to different schools, even though they were neighbors. They never really met each other until this day, the day, the big painting day. And they became very good friends. And they continue to be very good friends because they spent a couple of days painting together with me. And I think this is what it's all about. It's really not about painting a beautiful picture. Community Mural is about bringing the community together. It's a great excuse to bring us together. 
because um, we need to. Many, many communities, we're out behind our shut doors and closed windows, and we don't come out and we don't greet each other. So what better way than to paint a mural? Next, paint, next picture. So yes, they do. It's actually a magnet. You start painting, people get really curious. They stop by, like I said, uh, the first policeman really scared me because I thought I was in trouble until he got out and he goes, I want to paint. I have about a half an hour off, can I paint? So I said, welcome, you can come and, and join us. Next picture. And this is what's happening. We started here with uh, about uh, 25 kids. Before you knew it, so many other of the neighbors started coming over and they just started painting along with them with the kids as well. Next picture. As you can see, uh, you can make new friends. It doesn't matter the age. It doesn't really matter at all. Next picture. Uh, you can see here some of the moments that are happening, you know, where you can have people conversing, make, getting to know each other while we're working. We're having a great time. We usually have some music playing in the background. There's a lot of breaks uh, in between, lots of uh, free drinks and, and food to, uh, to, to have everybody entertain. Okay, next picture. And of course, you learn a lot, right? I mean, this was a part where we brought some people from the community and I learned about a lot, so much about their food and their music. And uh, it's it's just a joyful last painting day. That's that Saturday or Sunday where you spend eight hours together with uh, with your with your neighbors while you finish the mural. Next one. So yeah, this is part of that book that we eventually uh, created based on all our, our uh, uh, experiences. Next one. And uh, you have all kinds of people. I mean, this is like, here's a mom, you know, helping their little kid. This kid was maybe about three and a half, four years old. Uh, next picture. We have some moms that were new to the community. You know, some immigrants, they just showed up and then they, they just wanted to be part of it too as well. So everybody's welcome here. Next picture. Uh, grandpas are welcome too, of course, especially when we run out of uh, ladders. Uh, grandpas are very welcome. Just watch out for that hair. <laughs> next picture. And I'll show you some before and after, before I finish my presentation. Uh, this is uh, part of a lunch area where no one really stuck around. It was very boring. No one came by. So uh, the um, principal invited me to say, hey, we want to bring more of the kids in this area because, you know, there's more sunshine in this spot, but no one really hangs out. Uh, can you help us out? So this is the before. And the next picture is uh, five days later. This is what we created on that same area. So now this is a great place for everybody to hang out during lunch hour. The next one. This is in um, Fresno, California. As you can see, this wall, you would never take a second look at it. Um, you just walk by on your way to school. Huge wall with a huge potential to make it part of the community and actually identify the community. It's an agricultural area, an agricultural community. So this is what they invited me to do. This is what the before, and this is the after. Here we are, one of our biggest murals we've ever done. And with the agricultural thing, as you can see, everything is very simple, very graphic. Nothing is very controversial or political. It's just symbols that people can take a look and they can see and read in the, in the symbology anything they want to. It's just a night break and a moment of peace and quietness. So another one, let's take another picture here. This is the, another school, another area that was very critical where they wanted to bring people. They wanted to actually put some lunch tables here, but they thought, this would be pretty boring though. And this is the one that I've been showing you. So this is the before and this is the after. And now we have all these lunch uh, areas and tables where kids just come and hang out. And of course, promoting literacy, as you can see with this book, open book in there as well. Uh, one last one, let's take a look. This was in Chicago and this was a, a different occasion. Uh, this is an area where two girls that were crossing, they need to cross under this railway uh, railway bridge to go to school and uh, they were shot. Uh, there was a gang fighting and they were shot and fortunately they survived. Uh, but so the community invited me, they said, we have a very critical area where the, there's, this is the only way to get to the school. It's really scary and it's really dark and it's kind of dingy. And then we, we would like to bring some color to this area. So I was immediately called in. I, I was so drawn to, to do something with them. So this is the before and this is the after. And to your right now, to where you see the mural turning, that area now, it's a community garden where people are invited every spring to come and plant vegetables and flowers. And they've been doing this now for, uh, let me see, 10 years now. On the other side, now they created another mural. And as you can see, this is no longer that really scary area where you have to go by and try to go as fast as possible. 
So this one brought me a lot of satisfaction because the community continues to take care of it. And they also continues to grow with the mural and the additional mural and the community garden. Next one. And to me, these are the biggest rewards, seeing the eyes of these kids painting this huge thing that they've never painted before, knowing that it's going to be here for a very, very long time. Next painting. I, I keep saying painting. I don't know, because I'm a painter, I guess. Uh, but you can see, you can see how proud they feel that, of their accomplishment. You know, And uh, like I said, it's a community mural where everybody's invited. And the more diverse, the better it is. Next one. And uh, the friendships that you'll make, you know, um, it's just wonderful to see the gratitude of the community when you bring them something. And I get more gratitude from their help and what they created together to create that um, recognition, that unity and that uh, ownership and that pride to their to their neighborhood, that neighborhood that was neglected for so long. And all it takes is just a little color a little hard work, you know, and a little uh, sweat and five days of hard work. And but the community, we can do it all together. Next one. So um, some of this um, people that participated have inspired me so, on some of my books. As you can see, look how tiny she is, but she's got a lot of ganas, like we say in Spanish. Uh, next picture. She eventually, in my own version, became part of my book, um, that that was based on this our our whole story. Uh, next picture. So yes, I, I I truly believe this. This my 18 years doing murals has proven to me that art has a part to bring the communities together. No no doubt. Uh, last picture. So yes, you too. If you want to, you can create maybe something beautiful. Uh, so I encourage you to do anything with your community, whether it's in a small scale or a bigger scale inside your community, inside your school, wherever it is. It's not that hard. It's just uh, bringing some people together, a little organization, and things. Uh, you'll have an, an amazing time. This is, for me as an artist, my most rewarding activity when I, I create uh, community murals. So thank you for your time. Next picture. Um, and uh, I I want to get back to um, Maureen. And thank you also, Philippa, and everyone for, you know, to invite me to participate. So thanks again. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rafael. We we have a lot of questions in the chat and in the Q&A, so let me just toss some of those out there. Um, I'm I'm sort of speechless that it's just so inspiring and beautiful what what you're doing. Um, so, um, Jose Antonio asks, have you considered, uh, involving the community in the mural idea creation? Have I, uh, to my, let me see, I'm trying to read it here. There's so many, and thank you again. They're all very positive. So is, is the question, um, I'm trying to read it here. So it was at 455, but he was yeah, saying. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. have you in, involved people in creating the idea behind? Yes. Themselves? Yes. And that's a. Great question. I'm sorry, I didn't get it completely. I, what I do is before I do my design, I invite the, the community to give me ideas and themes and topics. So they make a big list. And I like to incorporate as much as possible some of the original designs. And and but also I want them to feel that they were part of the creative process. So this is a, a really very important part. I don't want to just come in and just establish something that my vision, I want them to feel part of that. Oh, this is that that was that was something that I suggested to Mr. Lopez. This is something that I said too, and this is part of our community. So yes, we do that in the process of creating the mural. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. And and then Nilu is asking, how about art which gives the feeling of three D or depth? Ooh, um, I think that could be a little more challenging, especially with uh, kids that have never had any experience. But you may be the first one to try it. I, I've never thought of that. Uh, I mean, I like to keep Mars flat, basically. And part of it is because of the time and the limited budget we have. So I, I know that we only have from five to seven days. And doing something a little more, it, it may require to be smaller and maybe something that needs to be built. There that needs to be a little extra materials to create that 3D sense. Or teaching them perspective, right? If you teach them perspective, then they get that 3D. But that might take more than a few hours to teach someone perspective. But um Maybe maybe someone knows how to do it. That would be a good good try. 
Um, we have a few questions about protecting and maintaining the mural. So like, do you apply mm. a top coat or veneer? Do you Great need question. to touch it up for the long term? What about sunlight? Great question. Okay, so there's two things that I want to cover here. Uh, usually warm colors like reds and oranges will fade faster than blues. Have you noticed when you see like an old posters, they turn very bluish, they go into the cooler side. When you when you go to like an old shop and you see a poster that has been sitting there for about 20 years and you go, hmm, it doesn't look that warm anymore. It turns bluish. So sometimes what I do, if it's going to be full of uh, sun exposure, and I know that I want this mural to last for 10, 15 years, I go more into the cool side of the spectrum of the of color wheel. I try to use more blues and purples versus oranges and reds. However, uh, they have developed now the chemi the, the the materials that they use to create the paint is now more durable, and it's um, it, it lasts a lot longer uh, against the UV rays. So um, twenty years ago, a, a mural would be vibrant for maybe four to five years. Uh, nowadays, if you paint with the latest uh, materials that they offer you, it could last a good seven to 10 years, very, very vibrant. So it's a pretty good lasting life for a, for a mural. Now, because of that, they don't sell you those coatings anymore. They don't, they don't do the coating. Uh, basically, the, the paint is hard, hard enough on, uh, to, to withstand the UV uh, rays of the sun. Thank you. There's so many questions. Yes. And I know we've gone <laughs> we over time. So many I'm questions. So, so sorry we to have, go over uh, time. Yes. Here, give you a short break. We have one for Maureen. Can you please post the link for all to the Living New Deal site that you introduced in a previous webinar? Um, the interactive map is a great resource for state history standards. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. And I think Tess, mm -hmm. yeah, Tess just put it in there. So I do want to recommend this, this website, the, the Living New Deal. Uh, it is a great resource, has a ton of information about post office murals and all a lot of other aspects about New Deal art. Um, and uh, uh, I did, uh, as I mentioned before, I could do a whole presentation on the controversy surrounding these murals. And I actually did do a presentation one time. And I I, I guess maybe Pam came to that and, and saw that presentation. Um, and uh, and the Living New Deal was was a great resource for preparing for that. I also want to recommend a website, um, actually a Wikipedia site. Um, which Tess Porter also just put into the um, chat there. Which, if you're, you know, if you're interested in finding out if there is a, a post office mural near you, it's a great way to do it. It's got all the states listed in order and the cities, and in many cases, the thumbnail images of the murals. Not all of them are still there, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, so a lot of them have have come down over time for different reasons. But uh, it's just a, a great sort of easy way to kind of figure out a little bit more of the locations and, and the history of, of those murals. So thank you for that question. Yeah. And there's so many things that I see there. It's amazing. Someone to says, have you ever used a graffiti removal for a clear coat? Uh, or yeah, I learned that there's a protected mixture. So I like to learn more about that. I don't know that basically with my murals, what I do is the, the, the communities where I leave them, I leave them with a, um, a, a map basically of the colors that we use. So in case, there is some kind of a graffiti or some tagging going on. It's a lot easier to just go back and repaint that area because everything is so flat. And like I said, if you use that flat painting, uh, you can you can remove that piece of graffiti in five minutes because you have the color there versus trying to scrape something up and maybe damaged it. But I'm so good to know about this graffiti removal thing. I'll, I'll, I'll need to find out more. So thanks again for all your very positive um, comments. I can see them all, so that's wonderful. If, do you have a little more energy, Raphael? We Absolutely, have... yes, yes, okay. of course. Mm -hmm. Any recommendation how to break down complex ideas into simple mural visuals? Ah, uh, that's the hardest part. Good question. Um, you know what? I think that one of the hardest things for a, a, a person that wants to create simple murals is our brains have a, a tendency to be very literal, even at, after all these years of doing murals. Uh, my first thing is to become very literal. I want to put so many things in it. And then I realized I got only five days and I got kids that I've never probably painted before. So you need to stop that and say, how can I just break things down? The best thing for me, my best things, if I better do this, is to start doodling things and start with just basic shapes, circles and lines and things, and then try to break down the shapes that you want into the most most basic things. Um, uh, you know, this... This is going to be very interesting, but here's a perfect example. I mean, I can do something like this and I'm going to see if I can do this. 
Here's a bird just by doing, I use a lot of curves. Here's another curve. There's another curve, straight line, straight line, straight line, curve, curve, another curve, and then straight line. Then, you know, I just do another curve and a circle. And there, you have a bird, right? You can use straight lines here too. So a lot of straight lines. And I'm doing this without looking at it. This is pretty funny. But you can see how I created something in a very, very basic way by just using the most basic things, you know, curves, straight lines, circles, line, triangles. And then when you start having fun with it, you realize, hey, you know, this is what I need to train my, my brain to do. Not look at the photo, but what is my mind seeing, how I'm picturing it. And that's that's the, that's the tricky part, but it's it's a lot of fun to try it. I think we've covered all the questions. Um, I'd like to just in one very quick minute show people. Um, so Tess has put the link to the Learning Lab collection in there and you'll see, you can see there that we've put everything you saw today, including um, you know the activity we did, the learning activity, a lot of the murals in the post office uh, collection the supplies list, including uh, what type of paint to use, additional museum resources, and then other, other resources as well. Um, Raphael has made some collections in the Learning Lab and we have a link to his website here. Um, also uh, recommended reading. So, so take a look at that if you're inclined. And we will also post the recorded webinar there as well. So I'd like to thank both Raphael and Maureen for being here today and Tess and in the background, helping us keep it all together. Um, our sign language interpreter and our captioner. Thank you everyone. And to our wonderful audience for being here today. And we look, thank you. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you at the next event in March. Goodbye everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye now.